Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. Hey everybody, you're listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast. What an amazing episode lined up today. I sat down with Bruce Gurnser. He runs BruceGurnser.net. Uh, Bruce pastored in IFB churches for about 25 years, uh, but he ended up leaving the ministry in 2005 and in 2008 left Christianity altogether. He's now a humanist and atheist, and he spends his time writing a blog about his past and present life. He talks a lot about the insanity of the independent Baptist movement. We talk quite a bit about that. Uh, he talks about playing whack-a-mole with David Hiles every time he sticks his head up. Uh, he talks about uh, some hearing whispers about the uh, Hiles controversies early on in his ministry, and really just talks a lot about what it was like being behind the pulpit in IFB churches and what eventually led to the burnout that him and his wife experienced back in the early 2000s. Bruce is a very awesome guy. I could have sat down for hours. He's a great conversationalist, uh, almost as good a conversationalist as he is a writer, and uh, that's saying something. And he really just brought a lot of great perspective, and he shared some things that were really startling to me that I had never thought of before. Uh, He's talked to IFP pastors currently pastoring who don't hold to the faith, but yet are scared to leave it because of fear of losing retirement or being outcast. And he talks about making a massive shift in his belief system at an older age and how that's not a common occurrence to happen. Uh, We just have a really good conversation. My favorite part in the whole episode is near the end, we start talking a lot about um, just being able to have dialogues with people we disagree with. Obviously, Bruce and I come from a life with two very different convictions and faiths, and I come at it as a Christian. I'm still a believer. I've mentioned on the show before, Bruce is a, a secular humanist and atheist. And so we have two very different perspectives, but we were able to sit down for well over an hour and really just talk through things, really find common ground. And I have nothing but good things to say about Bruce. And I think that's so important. And Bruce really echoes that as well. We have to be able to sit down and talk to people that we disagree with and people that maybe don't look exactly like us. And that's something that the IFP community has really done poorly when it comes to Bruce. He receives harmful messages all the time about his wife, about him, uh, about his daughter. He talks just really bluntly about what it's been like uh, to leave the denomination. And so um, I really hope you guys will listen to that episode. And honestly, that topic is just something that's been really important to me. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback just from even guests on the show who maybe aren't exactly down the line where some of the listeners are. And I just, uh, I really hope for a day where we as human beings can set aside our differences and sit down and just acknowledge the humanity of the person sitting across from us or on the website with us or on Facebook with us and just really uh, bond together over our common ground. And so I just hope that's what you take away from this episode. But enough of me talking. I'm going to let Bruce talk since he does a much better job than I do. Uh, So we're going to go ahead and get into the episode with Bruce Gurrenser. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for uh, jumping on the show with me and having this discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. You have a very interesting story. So you were a pastor of several churches. I want to say six. Uh, five, five churches altogether, if I remember right. It could be six. <laughs> <laughs> There's a long list. I was looking yeah. right before we uh, right before we jumped yeah. on. I was looking again to make sure I pronounced your name correctly. And then I was scrolling down again at the church. I was like, man, that is a long grocery list of churches. Yes. Uh, so you were a IFB pastor, actually, for 25 years. You actually left the ministry in 2005 and now consider yourself a humanist and an atheist. Um, I came into contact with you, just so you know, and I talked to you a little bit about this before we started recording. I actually came into contact when I was researching the IFB movement as a 
at the time, I have beer. I was looking into some abuse cases, some things connected to Hiles and, and things of that nature. And sure. your website was a wealth of information regarding some of these things and really shines a pretty bright light on a lot of the problems within the movement. But I'm curious, what was your introduction to the IFB movement? And can you just talk about the trajectory from from becoming a part of the, the movement to your ministry period as a as an IFB pastor? My first involvement with the independent fundamentalist Baptist church movement, you know, dates back to the early 1960s. My parents uh, moved us from Ohio to California, San Diego, and they joined a church there. It was the uh, uh, Scott Memorial Baptist Church, which was pastored at the time by uh, a notable evangelical fundamentalist pastor by the name of Tim LaHaye. And, okay. uh, and so my, my parents, you know, made a public profession of faith and that kind of set the ball, you know, rolling for me. They got in, involved in, in the church and got involved in uh, right-wing uh, extremist politics, were, became John Birch Society members, and yeah, it, it was kind of a whole package. For, but from that point forward, uh, until the, uh, for our family anyways, until the early 1970s, uh, we were in one form or another, we were in, a, in an IFB church. If, if I look at, at what point when I took on that identity as, as a person, it, it probably comes in my teenage years when we, and we moved around a lot. That's a whole story in and of itself. But after seventh grade, uh, my parents moved us to Finley, Ohio, and there we joined uh, Trinity Baptist Church. And it was a Baptist Bible Fellowship Church. And, and we got involved in the church just like we got involved in every other church. And and then at the age of 15, uh, so it had been my 10th grade year, there was a revival meeting at the church and I got saved. I was baptized. And a couple weeks later, I felt God was calling me to preach. And uh, from that point forward, you know, I was Bruce, the fundamentalist preacher. In fact, my youth pastor, Bruce Turner, you know, two weeks after uh, I said I was called to preach. He said, well, it's time for you to preach your first sermon. And wow. so he, and he sat me down and showed me how to make a sermon outline. And, and there we went from there. So I kind of, I started at an early age. By the right. time I got to college, I'd already been preaching a number of times. So that's where it started. And, you know, from there, a lot of his family history and background stuff went on, but eventually I ended up in Pontiac, Michigan, and I attended Midwestern Baptist College uh, for three years. Met my wife uh, there. She was the daughter of a um, IFB pastor. Her entire family, even to this day, is involved in the IFB church and uh, as missionaries, evangelists, pastors, and whatnot. And uh, we left college in 1979 and started in on the ministry, you know, started at a GRBC church in Northwest Ohio. And from there moved to central Ohio and helped with her, uh, helped her dad for a year or so at a church he had started. And then I moved to Southeast Ohio when we started an independent Baptist church there. And we were there for 11 years. And from there went to Texas, uh, from there back to Ohio. And it was during the move from Southeast Ohio and the move to Texas, and my theology began to shift away somewhat from classic independent fundamentalist Baptist theology, and certainly my associations changed. When there was the huge uh, uproar over, you know, Jack Hiles and the scandal there at First Baptist in Hammond, and his son David, and just... The, well, this might, all, this might be a, a broad question, but which scandal specifically kind of kicked that off? <laughs> so, I mean, there's there's a lot to talk when you say this, the scandal with Jack Hiles. Yeah. That's a pretty yeah. broad... Well, 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 for me, it was the article in the, the, the newspaper that came out. Uh, I can't remember the... Uh, I think it was Let Us Pray, maybe? Uh, well... It wasn't the sword of the Lord. It was another fundamentalist. Oh, oh, the saddest oh. story we ever published. Yes. And so it kind of started there. I read that and I said, you know what? This seems to be an awful lot at the very least smoke. 
for there not right. to be any fire here. Right. You know, and, and the stuff with, with, this, with, with David, you know, it seemed much more clear to me. Uh, look, you, you know, this, you had a real big problem with this guy in your church. And right. uh, as we now learn later, he was, you know, seducing young women and all sorts of criminal behavior. And, Child uh, abuse. Yes. So on and so yeah. Yes. And so his dad packs him up and moves him to Miller Road in Garland, Texas. And, uh, and what does he do? He, he starts it all over again. Right. And um, part of my uh, work that I do is, at least with him anyways, anytime he tries to stick his head up, you know, we kind of play that whack-a-mole game. And I just try <laughs> to smack it and say, no, let's not forget, right. you know, what's going on here. You know? Right. So it, it, it was at that point, and I was exposed to John MacArthur, for example, okay. his, his books on Lordship Salvation, for example. That got me thinking about, okay, what is it that we're really doing here? I mean, we're, we're seeing all these people saved, and our buses are filled with people, but, you know, we're, we're kind of just churning through numbers right. and numbers and numbers of people. And, um, Got me to rethink my theology somewhat too, and so from that point, I moved away from IFP theology. But I was still very conservative, you know, right. in, in every way. You know, I uh, even to the end, I think I was fairly conservative. Though I'm sure my colleagues in the ministry uh, considered me uh, liberal. But as you, <laughs> right. if you've been around the IFP <laughs> church long enough, you know, liberal can mean that anything yeah. i mean it's it's uh it means you didn't wear a tie sunday morning well or, yeah it's a it's a catch word that's used to criticize or discredit anybody who's doing something that you don't approve of so from that degree i've probably always been liberal at some point right. or another because i that kind of stuff never bothered me i didn't care what other people thought about what i did right you know and so that's kind of the 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 path that that you know brought me then to the end you know we ended up in west unity ohio finally and uh, i was there for seven years wonderful group of people but i was just to be honest with you probably burnt out and tired and right. so we we moved on from there and i got one little uh breath of air and i thought well at a southern baptist church well actually i had a uh, dozen Southern Baptist churches offer me opportunities to, to pastor their churches. I had a small church in central Michigan said, hey, will you be our pastor? And I said, sure. And that just didn't last long. And I, I, was, I was done at, at that right. point. And, and for, for a variety of reasons. You know, I have written some about that over the years and the, the emotional and psychological wear and tear and the, you know, wanting to see something more than what is typical in dysfunctional Christianity, which seems to be the, right. the norm. And I look right. back on it now, I probably, you know, my expectations were too high, but I, you know, I always, I've always been that kind of a purist, uh, you know, I want to, I want to see the best of whatever it is that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't work real well in a lot of churches. Right. You know, we talk a lot about the people behind the pulpit on the on the podcast, you know, mainly from the from the victim looking up. There's people who stay in congregations of these churches because of fear or a sense of duty or, or all these different things. Why did you feel drawn? Was it just purely because you were bought into the belief system? Did you feel pressure from, you, you say you didn't care about what people thought, but did you feel pressure from anyone else to stay in that position? No, I, I was a, what I call a true believer. Uh, you know, I've right. been often asked, boy, Bruce, you were pretty slow on the uptake. It took 50 years for you to figure <laughs> things out. And uh, I said, okay, you know, I, I guess yeah. I, I, I'll accept that. But the fact is, I was a, you know, a true blue believer. I believed what mm -hmm. I was taught as a child. Uh, my college professors reinforced those teachings. My peers reinforced those teachings. The insulated bubble that I was in, everything said to me that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. My preaching was well received, and mm -hmm. the churches I pastored were growing churches, and you know we were seeing people saved, and all all the you know quote unquote uh, markers of a successful church, 
And so all of that said to me, hey, I'm on the right path. But at right. the same time, there were, there were, as I took a, tried to look at the bigger picture, I looked at, um, boy, you know, on the family side of the equation, you know, I'm working day and night. Uh, we're living on poverty wages. And my wife is, we got six kids now and we're living in a dilapidated trailer and driving $500 cars and, yeah. and all, all of this stuff, right. you know, and, you know, but in my mind, I said, well, you know, uh, God will give me what I need. And, you know, uh, and I just need to trust him. And so uh, there was almost this passivity about life, you know, whatever came my way, I just accepted it. And uh, because that must have been God's will for my life. And the funny thing is that most of the people, including the people I pastored, they didn't play by that rule. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) their bank accounts grew, their, you know, got nicer houses and cars and all those things. And and this is not me, you know, uh, saying pity me or whining. It's just a fact of just how I viewed the world. And right. uh, of course, I view it very differently now. I can't help but look back with great regret as I see that and uh, or think when I think about that. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you mentioned that you talking to victims primarily, and and uh, I often tell people, look, I said when I when I look at myself, I see myself as a a victim and a victimizer. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm both. I was victimized to the degree that. I was raised in a a theological system, a way of life that materially affected every aspect of my life, right. controlled every aspect of my life. Well, okay. So well, I'm the victim I'm the victimizer though, because then I took those teachings, practices, and then I taught them to others. And so, you know, I believe that, you know, we should do this, this, and this. And uh, so on Sundays, I'd get up and say, you know, God says, the Bible says, you need to do this, this, and this. You know, and you, you're familiar, I'm sure, uh, one thing fundamentalist Baptists are known for is long, long, long lists of uh, Rules. <laughs> things that are sins and right. uh, church standards and... Uh, uh, I look back on it now, and I just shake my head. W- when you're in any bubble, it doesn't have to be fundamentalism. It could be any bubble. Everything makes sense. It's it's only when you get stand outside of that that you can say, boy, I had some crazy ideas, so, some crazy beliefs. This is an interesting subject. You're kind of confirming something that, that I've been saying on the show and that I've kind of come to realize. And it it comes to the topic of, I feel that the the camps in the IFB leadership kind of break down into two uh, two general categories. So you have your you have your because the, the argument that I keep getting from my former IFB, and I'm sure you get this plenty on your. I know for a fact you get this through your website. Is you know you can't broad brush the movement as a cult. You can't go after all IFB people are not like this and that kind of thing. And where I keep circling back to is. The reason that a church in California and a church in New York can both exhibit the same cases of abuse almost identically is because there's foundational theology or practice that's been taught and spread throughout these churches. And so what I've come to basically explain is there's two groups. So you have people who understand that that the way to manipulate theology and philosophy like a Jack Hiles, who was an outright cult leader and knew what he was doing. He did it for financial gain, sexual gain. You know, the man knew exactly what he was doing. And then you have people who went to Hiles Anderson. And there are some of those people that have graduated from there. But you also have people who were taught really poor theology and ways to think. And so even if they're not outright abusive, they're creating ministries that foster abuse because they're replicating the theology of an abuser. And that's Um, right. My question would be to you, did you identify any of that? So you, you said you mentioned like, you noticed the Jack Kyle scandals and things like that, but did you draw a correlation between the theology that he was preaching and how he was acting? 
or did you separate those things in your mind? Like, well, I believe the same things, but you know, obviously we're different people. Or do you think, oh, he was allowed to do this because of what he was teaching? No, I, I, I'm sure at the time I separated the two because, you know, I had similar beliefs as he did. And uh, my, my views of women and the family and uh, the punishment of children and how women uh, primarily should dress and act and behave. And, uh, you know, this uh, aversion to the, to the world and it's uh, uh, everything in it, uh, almost everything in it. And uh, uh, and so I, I saw people like Hiles and there were plenty of others. uh, Oh, sure. uh, (laughs) I I just saw them as bad actors, you know, that uh, they uh, were stains on the movement. Now, the farther I got away from that, the more I realized and realized about myself is that, no, we have foundational theological problems here. And, uh, you know, whatever I might believe about God now and the Bible and those things, theologically, these issues uh, lead to certain things, uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, pastoral authority, for example, where uh, a man or a group of men are given an in, inordinate amount of uh, authority over people's lives. And uh, Eric, we, we could uh, spend the next two hours just, I could share story after story about things that have happened, not only my own uh, years in the pastorate, but from my friends, you know, who be in the name of pastoral authority did awful things you know and not criminal right. things but treated people horribly um Can i've you... often i've often said that as a pastor in the name of pastoral authority and being right you know i ran off all kinds of very very good people right. you know they were they just disagreed with me on a particular issue but you know hey it's all in or you're out and uh, um, and so you you as the pastor become this uh, uh, authority figure that the, you're the hub around which the church turns. And mm-hmm. look, in any setting in life, I, it doesn't have to be pastoring churches. When when that kind of uh, structure develops, it there, it's going to lead to uh, abuse and problems. It just is, you know, autocratic thinking is not good, whether it's political, religious, social, you know, it it, it doesn't matter. And, uh, and for me, I know I saw where it just, it harmed people. And in the end, it robbed people of their ability to think for themselves because Mm -hmm. I was the guy in charge. I was God's man. God spoke to me. I was the leader. And uh, so this is what God wants us to do. And, and, and forget the churches and all that. I, I know uh, in, in my own life, uh, my married life, of having to deal with the, the effects of that, you know, uh, with my wife. And we've been married almost 42 years. And, you know, one of the greatest difficulties we did, had to deal with post-ministry was her absolute inability to make a decision for herself. Hmm. And it was because, you know, I, as I wrote in a post yesterday, uh, she, she ended up with this two eyed monster. Not only was I her husband is in this patriarchal setting, but I was her pastor too. Right. I mean, she just, (laughs) yeah, you know, she just had two Trump cards. (laughs) Yes. And so, you know, if she had divorced me, I wouldn't have blamed her because uh, now uh, things have changed dramatically for her, but she still fights with it because I think that that kind of authoritarian thinking, uh, it does deep psychological damage. Right. And, uh, and I know for me, uh, that's what counselors are for. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> Well, it's, it's just, it's interesting just hearing that perspective. And, and I like that you're addressing the fact 
you know, you're, I mean, you're doing one thing that you rarely ever hear IFP pastors do, and that is express any sense of, you know, guilt or regret over right. making a poor decision. <laughs> and there are so many issues, like, like I said, this show tends to deal with some of the more extreme cases of abuse, but it's also dealt with, you know, pastors who overdo their authority and, you know, expect a level of, you know, acclaim or praise or service that is above and beyond everybody else. And I, I appreciate you just being open. And that's one thing I appreciate about your your writing as well. It's almost hard to believe that you came from the background you did because your writing is so kind to except for some of your articles maybe about David <laughs> David Hiles <laughs> but uh but uh but you're writing toward fellow parishioners to family to people who reach out you're definitely very firm on what you believe now and very open about that but there's a very genuine sense of kindness and warmth uh in your writing and I and I really appreciate that the journey leaving the IFB. So so you left in 2005. What was that transition like? You you mentioned burnout. Was that the primary factor or was it a, a blend of burnout and then some doubting starting to begin or? No, the not, not at first. The, uh, it, it was mainly, I'm just tired. Uh, right. And uh, by then I had you know, in the 1997, I had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, was a certainly a, a factor that I, I was tired every day just to start with. The work became more demanding. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, depends on how you look at it. According to my counselor, I had this unholy mix of um, an obsessive compulsive personality with perfectionism. And, uh, and so that stuff just drove me, you know, and right. when you're not in good health, you know, you're going to drive yourself into the grave. That's what's going to happen. And so, uh, and so, you know, that, that was the backdrop, but I, I reached a point uh, for a couple years, 2005, six, seven in there, what, I call it our wandering years where we, right. my wife and I got this, we thought, you know, instead of, you know, starting a new church or whatever, let's, let's find a church that we can join and let's, let's help them do the work of the ministry. I don't need to be preaching every week and all those things. And, and so we started visiting churches and unfortunately we, became very disheartened, you know, by what we experienced and saw. And, uh, and we, we deliberately determined, you know what, we're not putting any uh, limitations on the type of churches that we're going to visit, except we're not going to visit, visit any IFB churches. And, Been and there, done that. <laughs> what did you see that disheartened you um, in well, those later, those later churches? Well, that there was, you know, for for all the differences, the names, the the denominations, and whatnot, at the core level, there were these paternalistic, insulated approaches and views of the, of the world. Uh, and um, we visited, I, know, I get a list of them on on the website somewhere, where uh, it was probably 100, 125 churches during that period of time. Wow, everything from uh, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, to you know every variety of evangelical church and mainline church you can imagine, and we did that in uh, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and we lived out in Arizona for a year, and we even did it there in Arizona, and drove over the border and visited a, you know, a couple of churches in California while we were there, and and it was just kind of dis on several fronts. First of all, it seemed to me that for the most part, churches just didn't care. Hmm. Um, you'd walk in the door. I mean, there were some churches we actually were able to get in the door, sit down, go through the service, walk out the door without anyone ever speaking to us one time. And it was, that was astounding to me because, uh, and, and again, I, I recognize that I'm judging these churches through 
my own experiences and how I, it was just not how I did things. I was a very personable person. Mm-hmm. I made sure that I, you know, when somebody visited, you know, I said, Hey, I'd like to come visit with you in your home, get to know you a little bit better. And uh, we found out that that's just not what happens in real life. Out of the hundred and so churches we um, visited, and some of them we visited for weeks, uh, some for several months, um, less than 10% of them ever uh, stopped at our home and uh, said, hey, how you doing? And we'd like to get to know you better. And Mm -hmm. uh, so it was disappointing. At the end, uh, by the time we got to... You know, 2008, we were uh, attending a United Methodist Church here in the little town that we live in. Nice people, nice pastor, uh, but we knew by then that we were done, you know, with the whole church thing. And um, so uh, it was kind of a a long, slow slog to that point, but we were still believers. You know, when we we said, "Eh, I've had enough with church. We were still believers, but it was from that point then that I began first uh, looking at and rethinking, you know, what it is I really believe, you know, can these various beliefs to my satisfaction uh, uh, withstand intellectual inquiry? And, and I started doing a lot of reading and, and an interesting antidote there is, you know, Around that time, I had a a lady from the church that I a pastor in Southeast Ohio. She wrote me, and she was alarmed. She had heard about what what I was going through, and she told me that I, you know what, you just need to quit reading all those books and just read the <laughs> Bible. And, <laughs> and I said, well, I can't do that because I've never been able to do that. Right. And, uh, books have always been uh, love of my life, and. You know, and so it's, it kind of led me to where I am today. It's been difficult, to be honest with you, uh, as far as, because the, for me, it was, I spent so many years, uh, it was 50 years in the Christian church as a whole, and, and 25 of those years as a pastor, and, um, uh, you know, I, we had friendships and colleagues in the ministry and all of these well, social I mean, your whole stuff. life was this yes. church, you know. Yeah. And all that disappeared almost overnight. And uh, so my counselor told, told me at the time that it, it's not common for guys my age to uh, walk away from the ministry. Uh, and the reason being is because of the loss of all these things. For some, it's the loss of also like retirement and, you know, things like that. Right now, I have a friend that I uh, have lunch with periodically a local uh, pastor and uh, not a believer in any real sense of the word, but he's older and uh, he knows that if he ever said, I don't believe that, uh, you know, he'd lose everything. Mm-hmm. And so he's biding his time and doing the work of the ministry and trying to help people and, you know, until he reaches, uh, you know, retirement age. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, but for me, because I never, I never made a lot of money in the ministry. And so it was not as big of a deal for me to say I'm done and yeah. walk away. And, right. uh, and so that's kind of where we are. And I've spent the last uh, 11 years on my blog and several iterations of it. And, right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, dealing with thousands of um, uh, unhappy evangelicals and fundamentalist Baptists who are angry at me, uh, mm. want to convert me, or slip my throat, or everything <laughs> in between. Uh, um, yeah, you know, it's it's such an interesting thing, and you and it's it's really quite sad. You mentioned you know, walking away when you're so entrenched in an environment where you can't be on the outside, you know, you, when you're taught to separate yourself from those who aren't like you, it's, it's really tragic that, especially when you're talking about Christians who are supposed to be loving and compassionate and, you know, available for others, it's 
fascinating that their first response to someone who is questioning or has even made a decision to separate themselves that there's this kind of fire and brimstone attitude toward them and i am still a believer myself i i find it really odd because i've gotten the same response because i read pretty broadly i listen pretty broadly i mean i spend time on your website i spend time listening to uh, you know i was just mentioning another episode of the podcast i'm listening to one of richard dawkins books now my viewpoint is the more that you search for truth the more you're going to find the truth. And sure, if sure. if you do research and it chips away at what you believe, you probably aren't believing the truth. Right. So you don't need to be afraid. If you're, that, if you're that afraid of hearing another viewpoint or spending time with a person who doesn't believe like you, you have a very fragile belief system. I think the fragility of independent Baptist theology and belief and that lifestyle is pretty shocking. It's honestly just, it saddens me when someone like you, who is a very good thinker, you're not a, you're not crazy or, you know, or dumb in any sense. Like anyone reading your your stuff would know, like you, you're putting a lot of thought, time and care into what you're doing. You know, I think it's a shame to write somebody off because of that difference. And I, and I, that just that belief alone makes me ostracized from a lot of people who are in that community. Yes. And it, it looks at me like, to me, the people, what they, what they do with me is they, they, what's most important for them is the need to be right. Right. And in the process of being right, they're willing to burn the bridge between us. And so there's, and so I, I tell them, I says, look, I, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you say to me, based on how you treat me, why would I ever want to right. be a Christian again or come back to uh, what what you are, you know? And and uh, they don't seem to understand that. It's almost like you know I, I've crossed the uh, the the unpard you know that the unpardonable sin, the uh, the line of no return, and right. so yeah. it's it now uh, uh, is they're free to just say whatever they want to me. And I believe me, <laughs> uh, I, I have had uh, people say things to me that uh, I guarantee Eric, they would never say that standing on my front porch because uh, <laughs> they would um, find their nose somewhere on the side of their face, you know, right. things about my wife, uh, about mm. my daughter with down syndrome and all oh, just all sorts of, horrible things and they do this in the in the name of god and i and i uh it troubles me i've had take for example i have a friend he just he died here earlier in the year and hmm. was a little older than me and uh was in the ministry uh and for a number of years and uh now i remember him coming up up here uh to talk to me after i had uh let people know that i was no longer a christian and uh, I mean, we probably sat here for two or three hours and talked, you know, and um, uh, he he just could not understand how this could be possible. And then he said to me, he says, well, fine. He says, but just don't tell anybody else, you know, because if you tell people, you're going to cause them to lose their faith. And mm-hmm. And I told him then, and I still believe too, I says, look, if just me telling my story causes someone to lose their faith uh there's a problem Mm -hmm. and uh now it doesn't mean that someone hearing my story or reading my writing it can't be a part of uh their journey and their decision to deconvert there's been dozens and dozens of people where that's been the case but there's nothing i say or write that is such that should cause a uh uh you know damascus road experience for, right. for somebody that all of a sudden they're no, they're no longer a Christian. Um, well, and I don't feel a sense in your writing. I don't, I don't feel that you're necessarily evangelizing people to some other side. I, I feel like the majority of what you write, I mean, obviously you allow some emotions into it because it is written from your perspective, but I feel like the majority of it is just pointing a light at 
the absurdity of some things and yes. allowing people to come to their own conclusion. You're you're pretty open, at least from from everything I've read. You're pretty open about the fact that it's not a place to convert each other to whatever belief system. And and I know that you you've made a point in several of your articles that you are inundated with messages where people are trying to convert you um, or convince you of their side. Yes. Um, but I, I feel like the majority of what you're writing, honestly, at least where I've come across is pointing a light at people like a David Hiles and saying like, what, what belief system do you hold to where this guy is still allowed to Correct. be doing anything in society? Like even outside a Christian realm, why is a guy like that? being given the time of day well well it would be it would be like i posted a story today about the southern baptist preacher daryl gilliard Mm. Uh, you know gilliard spent three years in prison for molesting two children yeah and he is now a pastor uh actually on his second church in jacksonville florida and uh and uh, i say how how does that happen and one of his supporters said was asked by the by the uh uh, news channel. He says, do you trust him with your children? Oh, I trust him. Absolutely. Mm. And I, and I says, how can that be? How yeah. can that be? But, uh, and that should be absurd to every thinking person, but unfortunately, uh, and it goes back to what we talked about a while back, there are theological teachings that cause people to think that way. Uh, yeah. their, their poor understanding of grace and love and forgiveness. Well, you know, Jesus forgave me, so I have to forgive him. After all, the Bible says the calling of God is, is without repentance. And so once a preacher, always a preacher. So who are we to say, you know, Brother Gilliard can't uh, be a pastor anymore? And I, as I said in the article I posted, I says, with all the prospective men that could be pastors, <laughs> the best you could find was a man who was a convicted child molester. Right. I thought, my, oh, my. He was in the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. Right. Uh, and I don't know that the, the current church he's with is Southern Baptist, but that was his background anyways. And my objective, I, I tell people, look, I says, I'm just one man with a story. Right. And, and, and that's really all that it is. This is from my perspective. It's from my understanding uh, you can love me, you can hate me. I, I'm just going to tell my story. And when I feel I don't have anything else to say, then I'm going to quit and, you know, d- you know, do something else. And, right. uh, um, I don't try to evangelize, uh, for atheism. Uh, in fact, I, I just, in fact, I don't allow atheists to do that on my right. website. They, they've tried. And I said, Nope, we're not going that route. We're not going to condemn people and attack them because that's just, that's just the reverse side of what fundamentalists do when they come. Right. I'm also curious to get your answer to this is one of the pushbacks on the show has been my dialing in towards specifically the IFB. So you mentioned, you know, the, the SBC is obviously having, or the Southern Baptist convention uh, for anyone who doesn't, know the abbreviation the southern baptist convention is obviously having their own share of problems regarding abuse uh, this year um there's been plenty of reporting done on that um but there's been a lot of pushback on me for dialing into the ifb and my you know my answer has just been well that's what i grew up in that's what i've experienced with um so i'm gonna start there um why would i start with the catholic church or the sbc or some other denomination but also to you know, it's, it's incredibly difficult to get accurate statistics regarding the independent Baptist movement by the nature of their, you know, feigned independence. Um, they're not exactly the take a poll type and check a box group. Right. Um, but it does seem to me, you know, as tragic as the, the Catholic church scandals are, you know, when you look at how many millions and millions of members there are of that organization, statistically any gathering of people that large is going to contain some really bad people. Yes. But my, my problem is, so according, I believe it was, um, I need to find the study, but I believe it was maybe Barna did a, a survey and they were saying that independent Baptists make up like 1% of 
the American population, which I think actually might be a little bit too high a number, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But it does seem to me the scale of abuse cases within the independent Baptist movement is very competitive considering the, the lack of membership. There, there's, a, there's a huge amount of abuse with a very small nationwide membership. Um, and so for me, like, I don't know how you would ever quantify this or prove this, but for me, I would argue that if I had to guess statistically, it would probably break down that they have quite a bit more abuse cases than the Catholic church does statistically or any other denomination you want to throw at it. It seems to be incredibly prevalent within the IFB. Do you think that that would be off base to say, or no, no. And uh, I remember uh, several years ago, uh, uh, Bob Gray uh, Sr. Uh, from, Jag- uh, from Longview, Texas, right. he, you know, he was mocking the Catholic Church and, uh, you know, and their, had their sex abuse scandals and, you know, and we independent Baptists, we don't have problems like that, blah, blah, blah. The guy has written six books about the most, uh, one of the most <laughs> abusive men in history. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, uh, and uh, you can't say that now. And I think what's happened is I think the abuse is far more prominent than we uh, even yet know. And I, the good news is, is that thanks to the internet, yeah. um, that these things are being talked about mm-hmm. and um, uh, no longer can, you know, uh, Pastor John Smith, you know, molest a girl in uh ohio and uh he gets caught and the church says just go away and so he'll move to california and start a new church and nobody's the wiser well the internet kind of closes off that distance and so uh, if someone is willing to talk about it and publicize it then uh, it's harder for those guys to do that and uh and and I, I I get every week there's somebody writing me and telling me about you know something that happened in their church and uh, or they think it's happened in their church. Uh, I can tell you one church that I actually went to as a teenager where there's a there's a guy involved in the choir that you know uh, he molested one of the pastor's daughters years and years wow. and years ago and uh, but she just can't bear to. Uh, bring that to light because she fears the the fallout that would happen and uh, uh, and what it would do to her dad who's in the ministry and and well thought of and, and so this guy's still in the choir and 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 I I'm of the opinion that those guys don't stop they don't stop until they're they're made to stop. Well, I posted a statistic uh, the other day on the preacher boys uh, social page. And it was from a book I'm reading right now about preventing child abuse in the church and the statistic about uh, abuse uh, or abuser, sorry, is pretty fascinating. Let me pull it up really quick. It was, um, yeah, the average child molester averages 12 child victims and 71 acts of molestation. Goodness. So that's, that's according to the, for the people who I know will comment, saying what's the source um the able and harlow child molestation prevention study um and then uh out of 561 sexual offenders interviewed there was 291,000 incidents involving more than 195,000 total victims um and then you look at you know um i'm sure you're familiar with sarah smith's um article with the star telegram where they they went to amazing work yeah and she I mean, they interviewed, I want to say 200 churches and found 400 cases of abuse. Yep. It's, it's, it's just a, it's just incredible numbers. And I, I've got to wonder, and I'm curious your perspective on this. When you're, when you're talking to people who are pastors of IFB churches who sit there and say that, you know, say that, you know, the, the lies, they're, they're lying about Jack Hiles or that his daughter's crazy or that, you know, people are just trying to attack the ministry. Do you believe these guys really believe that? 
or do you believe that they know what's going on and are just being complicit? Like, like a Bob Gray senior, does he truly believe Jack Hiles is a saint? Or well, you ask, that's a good question because I, I don't, and I don't know that I adequately have an answer for that. I think some of them genuinely believe that all of this is just, uh, you know, Satan's attack on, uh, hmm. the God's church. Right. And, uh, but there are others that look, their, uh, their, their goal is to, is to, and I'm sure you're familiar with the thinking, uh, you know, you, pr- you protect the ministry at all costs, right. You know, uh, whatever it takes, you make sure that, uh, the name of the church is not besmirched and, and, you know, and, and so, uh, they're very protective and, uh, and that's why, uh, you know, I'm thinking of a new Bethany home for girls in, uh, Louisiana there, you know, that was my first real entry into, uh, child abuse in, in IFB settings in these group homes. And I've met scores of, women who were victimized there and uh uh and, and yet that mac ford got through life and died without being mm-hmm. uh brought to justice and right. uh uh and it's because he had uh, people protect him and people who wouldn't believe that that stuff was going on and uh and others who probably knew it was going on but you know they didn't want to look like they were complicit in what was going on. They didn't want to get tarred with the same brush. Again, protecting their name, protecting their church, and, you know, maybe aware here in the news, uh, an hour and a half away from here in Winona Lake, Indiana, you know, you have uh, uh, Hesba House right. and Ron Williams, and uh, people have been talking about that for decades, and uh, yet somehow and I had them in my church years ago, thought they were wonderful. Mm. So it, yeah, I had a Ben, uh, Ron Williams son. He was on the show probably, I think five episodes ago now. Um, and he's been pretty vocal against the Hepzibah house and has been kind of rallying a lot of victims to kind of speak out against his dad and what they've been doing there. Yes. Um, but it's amazing. The lack of, I mean, one, the state of Indiana is just a, the, the way it deals with churches is awful. I mean, the fact that there was never any kind of legal action at Hiles is insane. But then you look at Hepzibah House and the fact that because they're a Christian organization, they can barely be touched by the government at all right. is, right. is tragic. And it, and I mean, I have a good friend who's been really advocating in Indiana you know, to extend the statute of limitations, to be more, to require more transparency from churches. But it just seems like, it just seems like that's a, something that's not going to happen for a long time. And that's really, I mean, that's a problem we have to face as a, I mean, that's a problem we have to face as a country is there's not much accountability for people based on religious exemptions. You know, there's, and it's, it's extremely concerning when you're dealing with the abuse of children and the fact that you can't, your hands are tied because it's a, it's a Christian youth organization. All of a sudden it's not child abuse. It's religious, you know, religious Liberty. Right. Um, right. And that's pretty concerning. Well, and that's the way it is here in Ohio. You know, the, the laws are such that, uh, you know, like in Southeast Ohio, for example, you know, we started a a Christian school and uh, there were actually zero laws that regulated us doing that. That's Uh, crazy. I mean, and we did what we wanted, taught what we wanted, disciplined the children the way we wanted. And uh, there was nothing, This there was no, and the state wants nothing to do with it. And uh, uh, and that's the foundation for abuse. When, you, when the doors are closed and um, bad actors are going to get involved, it's only just a matter of time and, and then you're going to have problems case of in Indiana, like you say, you know, you've got at, at Ron Williams's place, that's been going on for decades. And, uh, and so it's good that his son is speaking up 
and it's good that people that uh, were uh, in his homes were, are speaking up because it's the waiting on the state to do something. It's going to be a long time. No, it has to be, it almost has to be the court of public opinion to yep. really make the wheels turn. Yep. Um, so, so kind of winding down, I'm curious, I know you, I know you're not on a mission to deconvert people, uh, but I am, I do typically ask my guests, you know, what they would say to someone who's sitting in the pew of an abusive IFB ministry and is scared to leave. But I want to kind of twist the question a little bit and just ask, you know, obviously you don't want to, you know, demonize people for what they believe. Um, I mean, you didn't hang up the, the phone when I said what I believe, no. so, uh, which is, you know, very kind of you. Um, but I am curious what you would say if you could, if you could sit down and talk to, you know, somebody who's sitting in an IFB ministry right now, what would you say, to, what message would you want to give them? Um, what, what, what encouragement or advice or tip would you give someone who is right now just attending an IFB church and, you know, maybe feels like they can't leave or there's nothing on the outside or they're maybe even in, in a lot of cases with some of the listeners like scared to leave. Uh, what, what would be your, your counsel toward them? Well, and that's that's a big problem. Um, I have uh, regular readers who are atheists who go to church every Sunday with their wow. spouses uh, in evangelical churches because of uh, family pressures and all sorts of reasons. And I've often uh, counseled people to to kind of riff on the. Uh, what the Bible says, you know, count the cost before you say you're an atheist type thinking, you know, because okay. once you say something, uh, then uh, you can no longer control what happens next. And so in people in IFB churches who, uh, you know, they, they want out of the church, yeah. but they don't see a way. They have to be careful because they could bring themselves all sorts of heartache from whether it's church discipline or you know ostracized by people within the church and um, you actually wrote about that with um and i thought it was really interesting you you said you advise teenagers or people who are not in a position to leave to keep their lack of faith or lack of belief in the ifb doctrine at the very least to themselves until they're in a position to safely exit yes um, which in i think in other is, words lie <laughs> Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and that runs against my nature to tell anybody to do that. But yeah, but when you hear the stories of someone being beaten or, you know, yes. the stories of someone being harassed or, you know, it's I just had a guest on the show who, you know, he's tw he's in his 20s now. Uh, the episode hasn't even gone out yet, um, but he's in his 20s now. And from 13 to 16 was, you know stripping naked and being beaten with a hanger and it's like i mean that's not appropriate at any age at all but to be 13 or 16 and developing at that age and to just to be like humiliated in that way and he said on the show he said i just learned to stop talking and it's i think it's I, I don't recommend someone do that for the rest of their life, but I think there is that survival mode that you have to click into if you're in some of these organizations. And again, not yeah. all IFB churches are outright doing these things, No, but I mean, if you're in that environment, you know, like, you know, not to do that, like just wait out and make a safe exit. And I would say the same to, I've had lots of women on the show who have abusive husbands, like don't, you understand if you're in a situation where you can't talk it out, you may just need to go the route of slipping out middle of the night or slipping out with a right. friend, you right. know, so. Yeah. And, and it, you, you have to wait until you have the power to make change for yourself. Correct. And that that's going to be different depending on someone's age and uh, marital place. They have children. Uh, you know, there's so many variables yeah. You know, and, um, but the one thing I would tell us is once you get out, first thing I would encourage you to do is find a competent counselor somewhere and sit down and talk with them because I, 
I wanted to talk to you about that. So, and you're so therapist counselor, very stigmatized in the IFB circles. You think? Um, <laughs> but but it sounds like you keep referring to it. So it sounds like that was an important part of your recovery process, if not the most important part of your recovery process. And so, what was it that you did to overcome that stigma surrounding? you know, seeing a mental health professional and, and what would you say? Cause I, I'm sure there's people who leave, you know, even myself, I've been out of the movement for probably six years now. Um, and I just th- like this year or last year have really overcome that stigma. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it took me uh, the, the point where I realized that from the point I realized, you know what, I really need to talk to somebody. Right. Uh, it took me five years to get to the place where I could actually follow through with an appointment. I went through periods where I would, oh my word, if if I go see them, someone will see my car sitting in in front of their office, and and they'll know I'm there. And well, my, I don't want my kids to know that I'm you know seeing a counselor. And uh, and, and so I went through a lot of that. So I finally realized, look. Uh, you've got to do this for yourself. And because uh, as my counselor told me, I, I was just kind of like this big onion <laughs> that just had all these multiple layers that had to be peeled back, you know, and from uh, the fact that, you know, basically, you know, my emotions had been killed, you know, by uh, fundamentalist Christianity, you know, can't be angry, can't do this, can't do that. And, and I lost all sense of self-worth, self-identity. Uh, I, you know, the ministry became the sum of what I was. And, you know, and so I found, uh, which is difficult where I live because uh, people love Jesus here. And uh, so most of the counselors are, um, uh, Bible-based or newetic counselors, and right. so, so. But I, I found a secular counselor, an older man who was Episcopalian, and um, uh, started working with him. And uh, honestly, the most important thing I did in my life, bar none. And I, mm. it, it is standard. Uh, uh, when people write to me and I say, "Look." You need to seek out a competent uh, counselor and sit down and talk to them. That's important. Competent counselor. Yeah. Well, yes, yes. There's and a lot I, of incompetent counselors provided within the IFB for sure. Yes, and, and and I've written about that recently and caused quite a controversy because I said, first of all, most pastors are not competent counselors, right. and don't let them tell you that they are. Some are, but. The, the farther you go to the right in evangelicalism, the less competent they're going to be. And by the time you get to the IFB church hanging all the way out on the right end of things, you're going to, pro- most pastors are going to just tell you that your problem is, is that you're disobedient to the word of God. Get right with God, do what God says. And have more faith. <laughs> yes. will go away. And, uh, so I can't recommend it enough. The last question I, I always ask everybody, and I could, I mean, there's so many things we could, like you said, we could talk for two hours just about one or two of these topics. But um, the one thing that I ask every guest, no matter who they are, is, is there hope for the IFB movement to be reformed or does it simply need to be put to rest? And I think your answer could probably be uh assumed from the the interview, but I'm curious to hear your perspective um, and what you think uh, the potential of reform or the the possibility of reform of that movement is. Well, there's certainly reform around the edges. Uh, You know, you see guys moving, uh, you know, into more uh, what I call friendlier practices and theology, small percentage though. Um, the, the, the Are you IFB referring church, to like the the Josh Tice type? And not really familiar with him. Okay. Um, 
but you know, I, I, I there, some of my uh, wife's uh, relatives, for example, the edges around their theology don't seem to be as sharp mm-hmm. as their uh, uh, parents and their uncles. And uh, so I, I see some hope, you know, there, but in the main, the IFB movement is inherently harmful. I believe it causes uh, its view of women and uh, of human behavior and a host of other things uh, causes psychological damage. And, uh, and I think that it, uh, it, it can do such damage that it, that it just destroys people's lives. Now, not, not everybody. There are people that somehow are able to, to uh, swim across the, uh, the, the sewer channel and, you know, and not pick up some disease of some sort. But most people that I come in contact with have, have scars uh, from their involvement in, in the IFB church movement. And so for me, uh, you know, I tell people, I says, I'd like, I, I want to be there on the day that the IFB church movement draws its last breath. And I, and I want to be there because I want to hold the pillow over their face. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that's about as mean as I'm going to get in this interview. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, good. Rip. Yeah. And, uh, no, that's, um, you know, that's one of the things where I just really, cause I do like, I want to be, you know, like you, I understand there's a balance of, you know, are there good people within the movement? Yes. And yeah. there's good people within any harmful movement. And that's yeah. one of the reasons that they're harmful is they take good people and abuse them. And, you know, I, I stand with you in the sense of the movement as it is and as it was created to be by men like Jack Hiles, um, it can't be reformed back to something good because it started on such a rocky foundation. Correct. And so I think that what needs to happen is we need to clear out the the good people, which is one of the things I try to do with this show. Hopefully, they're still listening after <laughs> after that. But but uh, but no. But I think that I think it's clearing them out, and then however you want to say it, whether it's smothering out the the movement as a whole, or you know, taking a sledgehammer to the the foundation that Hiles so shoddily built for this, this movement. Well, and, and it, it's, uh, I think we're seeing us a, a slow move that direction because these, these churches as a whole nowhere are nowhere near as large attendance wise as they used to be. Right. And uh, you know, the, the glory, their glory days were the, the you know, the seventies and the early eighties. And, you know, they're now in this period of, uh, of, of decline. But unfortunately, their theology sometimes becomes more terse uh, mm. the, the more they decline. You right. know, it's no longer about numbers. It's about being right. And, uh, and commitment level from the members that are Yes, there. that's exactly right. And so I tell people, I says, look, I says, you want to be a Christian? Fine. I, at the end of the day, I, I, you know, I don't care one way or another. But I do know this. There are kinder gentler forms of Christianity out there than the IFB church movement. You don't have to be a part of this. You can find churches and uh, sects that uh, will respect you as a person, will treat you decently, and uh, will honor your family and uh, honor who and what you are. And, um, you know, and, uh, so that's my advice to people like that. And, uh, and we can, and, and you, you'll reach a point where IFB churches and then are just so marginalized that, yeah, it won't matter. And, right. uh, and you're already seeing that. Look, you know, the college I went to is closed. Uh, the church I attended while I was in college was one of the largest churches in the country in the 1970s. It's no longer in existence. And, uh, by every by every metric that I know, uh, IFB colleges and churches are, are in decline. I, I'm I'm going to throw one last question because I I have to ask this. Another one of the pushbacks that I get, even from people that are supportive of what I'm doing, 
is why focus your attention on a dying movement? And you, I mean, obviously you're committing a lot of time to writing. I'm doing this podcast. I know my answer to that, but I'm curious to hear your answer of like, why do you feel almost a decade removed from it? Why do you feel it's still important to discuss and and write about these topics? Well, the the movement may be in decline, but it's still creating a a lot of uh, damage in the lives of people. And uh, I have thousands of people who read my blog and uh, a fair number of them are uh, evangelical. And uh, my blog is not an atheist blog in any strict sense of the, of things. And, you know, my focus is on uh, religion and a a particular brand of religion. And, uh, and so I hear from a lot of people. And, uh, and I suppose if there came a day where I, I had gone months and months and had never received an email from somebody who uh, needed help or had yeah. questions or, or whatnot, then I could say, well, maybe we've reached a place where, all right, we don't need to do these things anymore. But that's not the case so far. I, I hate to tell you, it, you know, I uh, hear from a lot of people, women in particular, pastors, you know, <laughs> I, even in in my own family, uh, I've had interaction with uh, some of my wife's family, and uh, it's there's a lot of hurt, and uh, and I genuinely, uh, despite how people may think of me and at times take my writing, uh, I do genuinely care about people who are who are caught up in these things, and uh, because look, I I was there, I understand it. Uh, I know what it is to be uh, sold out for Jesus and to be, you know, entangled in, in this, in this movement and, uh, and know how hard it is to untangle yourself once you realize, you know, uh, you've made a huge mistake. Well, I really appreciate you. I mean, I know I, I know I mentioned at the beginning, but I just really appreciate you taking the time. And I, I feel, I feel like we're, you know, we're in such a similar area and such a similar goal of giving a platform to people who, you know, my, my thing that I've said to everyone regarding that is, you know, if two people are being abused or one person is being abused, that's enough to warrant talking about it. And, you know, the, the argument of, well, I bet you there's more abuse in this denomination or this other denomination is such a silly argument because it, it tries to, it just tries to add value to like, Hit, you have to hit a certain quota before we start caring about victims or right. about people. Uh, and yeah. and that's a, that's a really sad way to think. Um, because I know for me, I was, I was talking to, I was talking to my, my mom the other day and I was saying, you know, there's my story is not as bad as any of the stories that I've had on my show, but it's impacted me incredibly deeply i guess i guess we have to stop being to a point where we have to say like is it worth caring about this group of people or is it you know even a small denomination that's causing harm and i again i could argue pretty strongly that it's causing more harm than a lot of denominations on a statistic level but i think i think when you really break it down to these individual stories um those one people like you've said you're one guy with the story when we break it down to one girl in her story, one guy in his story. I think that it gets to a point where you start really humanizing the people who are being victimized instead of it being absolutely random person or face in the crowd. And so I really appreciate what you're doing. I mean, obviously we could, you know, I think neither of us want to spend our time debating the finer points of our belief systems. I think we both see, you know, there's, there's some very clear things that we can stand together on and say, this is wrong and needs to stop. And, you know, I hope that you, you continue to keep writing because I'm going to continue to read. And I hope, uh, I hope this show leads some more readers your way and, and um, that people will check out what you're doing. Because I really do, much like with what I'm doing, I really don't know how someone could look at what you're doing and say, you know, you're mean-spirited or you're trying to hurt people. I, I feel like it's just the opposite. Um, and I, I hope that's the connotation that comes away from my show as well. So. Um, but th- thank you so much, Bruce, for uh, for jumping on and for, for having this conversation and being just a genuine, you know, 
caring person trying to share your story. I really, I really appreciate that. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. And um, always happy to do this again sometime if you'd like. Perfect. So the link to your website's in the show notes. Um, is there anywhere else people can find you or keep up with you? Or is that the best, the best place? That's the best place. And uh, from there, they can find my social media links and on Twitter and Facebook. Perfect. And I hope you have a mailing address so people can send you uh, chick tracks. And, uh, uh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I don't want to take too much more of your time, so yeah. um, I'll go ahead and sign off. But I, I really appreciate the conversation. And honestly, I'd love to uh, – I'm excited to hear the feedback for this episode, and I'd love to love to talk to you again in the future. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.